Now let's look at the Lars Lasso algorithm in a little bit more detail. Here's a basic pseudocode description of the algorithm. There are some things to add, but overall this is a general idea. First of all, we, can, we begin with a zero model. Because we have the zero model, the residual of the model is y minus the model times our x's, which is of course just y itself. Now something that makes the Lars algorithm very special is you want to maintain a list of active variables. As a data structure, the active variables list could be a list object that's been sorted and therefore easy to search. It could be a set object if your language supports that. And actually, if you're using NumPy, a convenient way to do the active variables is as, a, is as a Boolean array that you can use for rapid indexing of your model. So we're going to loop until we're, not use, until we're using all of our variables. We're going to look at our current residual and find the, the variable that's best correlated with the residual. And by the way, this is the variable that's not in our active list. So among the inactive variables, let's find the one that's best correlated with the residual. We will then include that variable in our active variables list, and we are going to build a new model that's the best fit of the active variables, including the new one, with the current residual. Again, not with the actual response variable y, but with the residual after you've incremented your model a certain amount. And as we discussed, we don't want to simply add mi to the existing model m. What we want to do is only add a portion of it, and we'll call that portion t. I believe the book calls it alpha, which is the proportion of quality versus the inactive variables that remain. In other words, we want to know how much of mi this new model should we add to the existing model. How much should we adjust our model until some other inactive variable is just as important as the variable xi. Once we find that number, and I'll describe how to find that in just one moment, we're going to update our model m by taking the previous model and adding this scaled version to it. Now we have a new residual, which is y minus x times the model, as usual, and we'll repeat. Sometimes the goal is not to build the entire large trajectory, but simply to make a decent model. Say maybe you want to account for 85% of the response in your original data set. So let's compute the residual sum of squares of our model and simply stop if it's already good enough. Or maybe you simply want to uh, account for no more than five variables and you might stop if the number of the size of the active list is greater than or equal to five. If you don't break in that such a situation, you'd actually build up the entire least squares fit model. And at the end of the day, you want to return the model. Okay, so there's a few details here. First of all, you have to keep track of your active variables. You have to repeatedly compute the, um, the correlation of your variable list with the residual. That's actually quite easy to do in an updated way if you write down the equations by hand and think about them. And you have to figure out this number t. And actually, there's one more thing here that's sort of implicitly in here, but I didn't really say, that you're actually making a list of models. Remember, we're making a trajectory through the space of models. So often what one actually wants to do is not return m itself, but return the list you've made. So maybe a good idea is to think about not making a model, but each time you run through this loop, you append the model to a list of models which you've been building as long, along as you go. And so the user might want to see the models one by one in order to know which one is preferred for their situation. Another detail that's not in this pseudocode is that if this model m plus t m i takes some coefficient to zero in the model, then we should, at that point, after detecting that effect happening, we should figure out which variable, let's call it maybe x j, which variable x j if its coefficient go to zero. And what we'll do is we'll toss x j out of the model and go back to the while loop um, having included xi but excluded xj. So we can actually update the active list after this set point um, before building a new model. In other words, there's an early break here that if one of the coefficients in m becomes zero, we'll, up, we'll change the active variables list by discarding something and then exit this, that, then uh, produce the model but then exit the loops that next time that variable is available for reuse. 
And if you think about how the algorithm works, it actually won't be reused for at least one more variable. <clears throat> at least something else will happen first. OK, so we've talked about the active variables list, the idea that you're computing correlations with the residual, not with the actual response variable y, and that you might want to break under various situations. To me, as a mathematician, the most interesting thing about this algorithm, aside from this all L1 versus L2 balance, is how to find this proportionality constant t. The way the book describes it is very simple-minded. It simply says, essentially, increment t, or they call it alpha, until um, you detect this change of which variables best correlate with the residual. So that's some sort of loop argument where you maybe take a small step size or maybe do a bifurcation, a bifurcated loop system, uh, loop detection. Sorry, a bifurcated zero detection, like a Newton's method type argument, to figure out what the optimum t is. But in fact, if you think about the calculus of the situation, that we're trying to figure out where is a certain line or a family of lines tangent to some family of ellipsoids, well then we don't need to do this. In, through some sort of estimate, we can just compute it using a derivative. So I'm going to go through a computation now of how to compute this variable t with minimal effort. So here's the situation. Suppose we have two uh, variable indices, i and j, and we currently have a response, r, which is y minus x times some model, and we've already computed this increment d. So by the way, this is a little confusing for, the, for this video, but the book calls it delta A. In my previous slide here, I called that, um, so the book calls it uh, delta K is the old model of active variables plus some proportionality constant alpha times the new model. So delta K is actually this the incremental model. In my other slides here, I called it MI was the incremental model. And I call it t instead of alpha. So there's a lot of notation going on here. Hopefully you can keep it all straight. You can code it however you like. Probably want a name like incremental model or something like that, model to adjust, whatever name you like. In this pseudo in this derivation here, I'm going to call it d. So we're trying to build the model like m plus t d. And the point is we want to figure out what t is. It's going to be a number between 0 and 1, right? Use none of that new variable or use all of it such that um, there are two different variables, maybe the ith variable and the jth variable, that have the same correlation with the response. Covariance, I should say. So this, is, this was the condition in the original algorithm description, right? You increment a, a variable until some other variable becomes equally important. OK, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a little bit of calculus to figure out what that number t is. First of all, these are we want to compare the, these residuals in absolute value, the, these uh, correlations in absolute value. So what we'll do is we'll take, as we always do in mathematics, we'll take the square so we don't have to deal with nasty square roots. And now we'll solve this quadratic equation. So if, um, if the response versus the proportionality constant t and the model of variable xi, and the response um, with proportionality constant t and, and variable xj are equally uh, balanced, then these two quantities are equal, and we can expand this and solve it using the quadratic formula. So we expand this side and this side, set them equal to 0. Those are our terms, our cross terms. And now we start solving, right? Minus b plus or minus b square plus or minus square of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. And we do this. I'll let you work out the details. I'll go through this pretty quickly. But here's our classic quadratic formula. We can expand under the square root and expand all that mess. A lot of terms cancel. We come up with this. And you look at that and recognize that it's, in fact, a perfect square. So when we simplify the quadratic formula, we see that we've got this term dj rj minus da di ri plus or minus two times the square root. It's the square root of a perfect square, so it becomes absolute values. Now the plus or minus from the quadratic formula means I actually don't have to worry about the absolute values here because it's plus or minus an absolute value, so it's still plus or minus, plus or minus. And 
in the end, we can distribute the plus or minus and see that the, t the stopping time, tj, is, this, is one of two quantities, minus dj rj plus di ri, plus or minus dj ri minus or plus correspondingly, because this is distributed, di rj. So notice the symmetry here, dj rj, di ri, dj ri, di rj. It's a symmetric expression over di squared minus dj squared. So this is something that you have all these numbers. You have the response, and you have the new, newly computed model. So what you do is of these two, so this is, of course, two different numbers. We've solved the quadratic formulas. We have two possible answers. And um, of the two, one of them is, is going to be within the interval 0 to 1. Actually, in many cases, it's equal to 1, because the idea is you want to maximize that variable anyway. But you're going to pick the value between 0 and 1. And if there are two such values, then you're going to pick the smallest of the two. So you can think about the analysis of this a little bit on what it is you want to do, what it is you want to accomplish. But ultimately, it means that we have an expression for how much to adjust the model. Oops, sorry, let me uh, go back to that page there. I scrolled too quickly. This is a PDF, by the way, I'm going to put on, on the learning management system so that you can examine it carefully and think about it. Um, that sort of discusses the mathematics of the algorithm. Not so much in the pseudocode, but more in sort of a description of what you're trying to accomplish. So we can compute exactly what the stopping time is without having to do any sort of iterative um, or Newton's method type process. So in the algorithm as described here in the book, it says the coefficient profile evolves as beta over the active variables of a function of a variable alpha is the old one plus alpha times the new one. And um, they basically say, well, let's go until uh, we get some new direction and we get the smallest angle between them. But in fact, we can compute that precisely, even though it's not mentioned in the book, um, what that variable alpha is. And Again, in my pseudocode here, that means that we can just simply have a simple function here that given the current model and the current residual tells you when to stop based on that data. So if you just recompute the, uh, you know, you've got the residual um, of, the, of the previous model, you compute what the model would be with MI, and um, you can figure out what that stopping time is. It's very convenient. So if you think about what this is doing, is actually this is a very, very efficient algorithm. You, you start off with one variable xi, and you build a one variable model using only xi. Then you get a second variable, and you build a new model, but it's already using the one variable model. It's starting at the one variable model you already have. So you don't have to recompute the one variable model. You simply move incrementally from it. Right? This is addition, not replacement. So in fact, if you think about the way one would solve a system of linear equations using um, QR factorization or the various algorithms for solving a, uh, a, a linear system of equations, they are iterative in the sense you solve by one variable, then by two variables, then by three variables. So in some sense, what this large algorithm is actually doing is it's doing the incremental solving you would do to solve a least squares problem but it's doing it in an intelligent way that as it solves, it's solving what it needs to reproduce the trajectory in the L1 versus RSS space. Okay, so there's lots of details in this algorithm to sort out. You have to think about what shapes and sizes your different arrays ought to be, how to use the Boolean array of active variables, how you want to compute and keep check of these cutoff T values or alpha values, and how you want to present the model to the user either as a trajectory or uh, as a list of models and so on. But I hope overall you have a sense of what this algorithm is doing and why the different pieces fit together. By piecing together these slides in this video with the information in elements of statistical learning, you should be able to come up with a very good version on your own, which is in fact almost as fast as the standard algorithm that's found in all the packages.